There we are. So this talk is about the power of the feminine, the menopause, and approaching death with trust, because this is a very important part of our whole life. We can't shut it out. So I think this is an extremely challenging time. I'm sure you agree with me to be alive on this planet. And it's difficult to understand what's happening. We see world leaders who are stuck in the past, still acting out the old story of power over each other, completely unconscious of the higher values which serve life. There is absolutely no recognition, generally speaking, that life on this planet is sacred and that everything we perceive with our five senses is part of the divinity of life. Nor is there as yet any recognition that what happens on this planet is of concern to other interested observers in the universe, because we don't accept there are any so far, but there are plenty. Yet this dark and ignorant night we are passing through holds the potential for a great renewal or awakening. And we have to trust the process of transformation that in its widest sense is related to the transition between the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius. Now we're all on a journey back to our source. Our bodies as well as our souls are on this journey. The menopause is one phase of this journey, perhaps the most important phase in a woman's life. It involves a woman coming into her true feminine power looking back over her life and answering the questions, who am I and why am I here? And how can I discover a deeper and more meaningful relationship with the gift of life that I've been given? How can I pay more attention to my body and care for it with greater love and compassion? And how can I make time to listen to the voice of my soul and grow into my true potential as a woman? Now, millennia ago, women lived under the protection of a goddess, and as late as Roman times, they served the goddess in her temples. This changed with the coming of the patriarchal religions that banished priestesses and silenced woman's voice. Woman's fertility was once seen as part of the fertility of the great mother, nature. Her life was related to the growth of the crops and the flourishing of plant life and the great cycle of birth, death, and regeneration that was associated with the moon. Woman was revered in these early societies because like nature, the great mother, she was the bearer of new life. As long ago as the Paleolithic era, the 13 months of the lunar year, year each consisting of 28 days, were connected with the 13 lunar months of the gestation period of the child in her womb. So everything above and below was connected. In an earlier talk for Kalo called Birthing a New World, which is on my playlist, I explained in detail what happened when the patriarchal religions abolished the divine feminine and how this led to nature being split off from spirit, cut off from spirit, leading to the situation that we find ourselves in now. Now we live in an amoral, dystopian, and very ruthless culture. During the last 60 years, we've been through a sexual revolution where the relationship between men and women has changed into something that's mainly focused on sex, not relationship. We have also been through a digital revolution. Owing to the huge influence of social media, there is now an excessive emphasis on sexuality in general and the promotion of casual sexual encounters in particular. Sex has been demoted to a purely bodily function where love and commitment are secondary rather than a primary consideration. Pornography is a hugely corrupting aspect of this revolution and rape, which was rare when I was a young woman 70 years ago, is now endemic. The sexual revolution has sold women short because men have been the main beneficiaries of it. What conclusion would teenage girls who watch Love Island draw other than this is a model for them to follow? 
Louise Perry has written an excellent book about this called The Case Against Sexual Revolution. So we can watch girls enter the maelstrom of social media when they enter secondary school around the age of 11, when they are at their most vulnerable. Before they've become fully aware of their sexuality and their changing body, they have to face the shock and ordeal of being physically assessed by boys in their schools. Boys who have been prematurely seduced by pornography and see girls only through that corrupt lens. We have not been taught to love and respect our bodies and to care for them as something infinitely precious right from childhood. We offer puberty blockers to children to slow down gender changes such as breast development or facial hair without assessing the effects of this interference on both the body and the soul. Later, we accept the mutilation of the body in order to affect gender change. People, least of all children, have not been taught that their body is a miraculous organism, the physical temple of their soul, designed to sustain life and to enable us to incarnate on this planet. Under the powerful influence of something called scientific materialism, the body is viewed as a mechanism, something that the mind or the will can control. What is needed here is the voice of older women mothers and grandmothers who can speak up for the values that are missing and who can offer some protection to their daughters and granddaughters and also their sons and grandsons from the deficient values that currently rule social media. I should say here that the body was always considered a problem in Christian civilization. And this is an idea that had its origin in the Hebrew myth of the fall told in the second and third chapters of the book of Genesis. This myth was only created in 621 BC by a powerful group of priests who took control of the temple in Jerusalem. They ditched the goddess Asherah, who was the consort of Yahweh, and gave Eve her former title, mother of all living. That's the title of Eve, mother of all living. This myth is where we lost the belief that the body and the whole of what we call reality is sacred, a hugely important concept that had always existed in earlier civilizations. Since Eve was the primary agent of the fall, she took the blame for our banishment from the Garden of Eden. And this led to the unrelenting persecution of women who had the heavy burden of the sin of Eve placed on them by generations of Christian priests culminating in their being tried and condemned to death at the stake by the Inquisition for consorting with the devil. This immensely powerful myth is the main root of the misogyny that pollutes our culture to this day, giving rise to a deep unconscious suspicion, even a fear of women and a consequent desire to silence and control them. Although great progress has been made over the last hundred years, women are still struggling to gain acceptance and put an end to domestic violence, rape, and trafficking. Now, from the perspective of our relationship with the earth, this myth and the loss of the goddess and the divine feminine over the last 2000 years was a catastrophe. Everything that was once associated with the divine feminine, that is nature, matter, sexuality, and the whole instinctual aspect of life, including the body, was excluded from the sacred. Nature, split off from spirit, was effectively de-souled, and that's the origin of our problem today. We lost the awareness that spirit is active and present in the world, and we lost the sense of living within a sacred order. This myth imprinted us with a negative image of our presence on this planet and placed a heavy burden of shame and guilt, particularly sexual guilt, on our shoulders. St. Augustine compounded this burden by promoting the pernicious idea, pernicious idea that original sin was transmitted through the sexual act. If you can believe it, that became actually in doctrine in 418 AD. Speaking as a psychologist, I believe that the present obsession with sexuality is an unconscious attempt to compensate for its former rejection as something dangerous and threatening. 
It is necessary to say here that because of this past history, it's extremely important that women become aware of where they might be being manipulated, either in the context of a partner who is exercising control over their life, tracking their every move with suspicion, or in the context of governmental control, which also may be excessive, as in the recent lockdown situation or the abortion situation in the US. Fear is the most powerful weapon of any government and is something to be aware of as a factor in enforcing conformity and obedience on an entire population. Women for millennia have unconsciously condi been conditioned to obey authority, whether the authority of the church or the state or their husband, and also to play a role in society that was expected or even demanded of them. Learn to trust your instinct if it is telling you that something doesn't feel right or that important facts are being swept under the carpet or censored. Question everything. Now we can return to the menopause. For centuries, the menopause has, like menstruation, been a taboo subject, shut, shut away behind the drawn curtains of society, an embarrassment, something that was never mentioned in public and certainly never mentioned by men, even in the privacy of the home. Too often in the not so distant past, older women who were skilled in the use of healing, herbal remedies and healing were demonized as witches and older women with lined faces and withered skin were called hags or crones and shunned and even feared by society. I'm sure you can remember fairy tales which have crones in them some evil like the witch in the story of Hansel and Gretel, but others who bring magical assistance to the hero or heroine in the task that they have to accomplish. The fear of old women has to some extent diminished, but not yet enough for society to value older women for their wisdom, insight and life experience. In this country, the BBC ditches women when they get to be about 40 or show any signs of aging. Uh, it's shocking, absolutely shocking. And people have told them there's not to do it, but they go on doing it. So indigenous societies see the menopause and the years that follow it very differently, not as a decline and a taboo subject, but as the most important phase of a woman's life when she's revered as the holder of wisdom and continuity for the community. And when she enters her true power as teacher, healer and purveyor of wisdom, I heard recently that one such society named the three stages of a woman's life as the flower, the fruit, and the seed. Her flowering as a young woman, her growing to maturity in the fruitful years of motherhood, and the seed after the menopause, distributing wisdom and rich experience to her society that would nourish and guide future generations. Now, women's greatest gifts are the values of the heart. And I think these are love, compassion, empathy, the instinct to form relationships, which women are so good at, and the longing to heal, nurture, protect, and cherish. These gifts can be applied to any creative field, not only the raising of children. They are the origin of the values that should direct civilization and they should be incorporated into every educational system, beginning with children in primary school, helping them to develop empathy, which they already have. It's just a question of making it more conscious and developing it. The fact that too many societies do not honor these values reflects the unconscious state of humanity. Now, I'm very fond of Jane Goodall, and so I thought I would bring her picture here for you. She's the great primatologist who has spoken up so elo eloquently on behalf of the earth. And she's an example of a woman who has been true to those higher values. Often this will bring you up against the collective values of society, values that need challenging and changing. Hence her words, it actually doesn't take much to be considered a difficult woman. That is why there are so many of us, but there need to be a great many more, I think. Now, with the onset of menstruation, nature prepares an adolescent girl for her future role as mother and bearer of new life. 
And with the menopause, she opens the door to a different and supremely creative phase of a woman's life and a different kind of power, one born of maturity, experience and wisdom. The menopause can be the most creative period of a woman's life when she passes through this door to become the wholeness of who she is. She has access to the power that comes from a different kind of creativity, born of rich life experience, as well as the flowering of her gifts, or even the discovery of new gifts, which was my own case. Think of the thousands of opportunities that now exist for women to develop those gifts that didn't exist 100 or even 50 years ago. The menopause frees women from having periods and the mood swings that accompany these. It marks the end of the childbearing years and often coincides with children leaving home, the arrival of grandchildren and a whole new dimension of human experience. The menopause can also bring new responsibilities for caring for elderly parents that can weigh heavily on women since they are the primary carers of both young and old in any society, and they always have been. In societies which gives the, give the highest value to youth and sexual attractiveness, menopausal women may enter their late 40s and 50s with a feeling of diminishing worth. They may feel on the shelf, ignored, neglected, no longer seen, valued, or welcomed. Their creative lives are apparently over, and the prospect of death or dementia looms ahead of them. It can be a time of declining strength, depression, and a growing sense of helplessness and hopelessness because they feel they no longer have the strength and the abilities and sexual attractiveness that they once had. Now, much of this can be helped by a good diet and plenty of exercise, but older women tend to eat more when they feel unhappy and not to bother with exercise because they're too busy looking after other people, both the young and the old. It can also be helped by methods of meditation that calm anxiety and bring a sense of connection with a deeper ground. The menopause is not a disease, but a natural process, part of the rhythm of nature that takes us as part of the life of this planet from birth to death and beyond. However, the symptoms that develop in the course of it can be distressing, even if they are not life-threatening, but they can be alleviated. I learned this week in a fascinating article that the menopause is apparently triggered by the loss of eggs carried in the ovaries. Each month, women ovulate one egg, but also lose thousands more from the amount allocated to them at birth. Eventually, a threshold is reached that is so low that it triggers the menopause. Basically, the ovaries run out of their reserve of eggs. Menopausal symptoms can begin in the 50s, but sometimes in the 40s or even earlier. These generally consist of hot flushes, night sweats, exhaustion, inability to concentrate or brain fog, a diminution of libido and dryness of the vagina, insomnia, and chronic depression. In addition, as they grow older, bone density may decrease, particularly in thin women, leading to osteoporosis and falls and broken limbs. Now, instead of being prescribed HRT for these symptoms and for the stress of living in a dysfunctional society, millions of menopausal women during the last 50 or so years have been prescribed antidepressants and tranquilizers. I was myself in a time, for a time. Millions have become addicted to Prozac and Valium. Antidepressants do not address the basic cause of menopausal symptoms, which is a decrease of those ovarian eggs and the hormone estrogen. And they do not address the cause of anxiety, which may arise from the stress of trying to bring up a family as well as follow a career and get to grips with the technological demands of the digital revolution, which I'm still getting to grips with myself. So to give you an idea of the scale of antidepressants prescribed, <clears throat> there were over 21 million antidepressant drugs prescribed in England in the first quarter of this year, a million more than in the same months last year. And in the US, almost 25 million adults have been taking antidepressants for at least two years. It is not possible to say how many of these were women and what age they were, 
but it is a fact that twice as many women as men suffer from depression because there is a hormonal element in women that is not present in men. Now the medical profession and science as a whole have been very slow to focus on women's health in general and the menopause in particular, because it simply wasn't, it was beneath their radar, they just weren't interested. And there was no training for physicians in the menopause. In the UK, there was, however, a remarkable gynecologist, the late Professor John Studd, who was a pioneer in treating women with HRT. Professor Studd started the first ever menopause clinic in this country in 1969. He did not prescribe oral estrogens, but transdermal patches or gels, particularly a gel called estrogel. Hormonal treatment for the menopause was so controversial at the time that his clinic was closed down for three months following protests from the British Medical Association. <laughs> Can you believe it? <clears throat> but when it opened again, women flocked to it. And for decades, he tried to demonstrate to psychiatrists that estrogen was a much better therapy for depression in menopausal women than antidepressants. But as with so many pioneers in medicine, his clinical experience was ignored and is still ignored by them. I tried to get a friend of mine who was being treated by a psychiatrist to have HRT, but she was too frightened of the psychiatrist to dare to speak up and ask for it. I was lucky enough to be referred to him for a hysterectomy. I had always suffered from depression and my life was completely changed by the HRT, HRT he prescribed in the form of estrogel. I'd already tried um, herbal remedies and St. John's wort and, and other things like that, natural estrogen and progesterone, but it did nothing work. I am now 90 and in, in the last 30 years, I've written seven books, given umpteen talks and webinars, and in general had a very creative, rewarding and active life, all because of the help I've had from estrogel. Many years ago, Professor Studd published a paper with the heading, 10 reasons to be happy about HRT. HRT, he said, will stop hot flushes and sweats. It will stop vaginal dryness and loss of libido. It will increase bone density and prevent osteoporotic fractures and protect intervertebral discs. It will reduce the number of heart attacks. It will improve the texture and quality of the skin and it will lift depression and reduce stress and anxiety. Finally, it is safe and does not lead to cancer. Recently, he added that it may perhaps have another advantage and that is to decrease the risk of Alzheimer's disease in later life. This has not yet been proven in a controlled trial, but I personally think that there is a lot to support this hypothesis and that it should be investigated further. Before he passed in August, 2021, he noted that there is now increasingly reliable published data from King's College London, Baltimore, USA, and even Wuhan in China, stating that HRT protects up to 50% up to of COVID cases. Until 2002, things were looking up for women as more doctors were prescribing HRT. But in that year, women were suddenly refused HRT by doctors in the US and the UK. And one of the reasons for this refusal was, in Professor Studd's words, a very expensive 2002 study of oral estrogens, oral estrogens note in America, where they chose the wrong drug, the wrong route, the wrong patients, the wrong age, and came to the wrong conclusions. And this is a study that cost more than $1 billion. All the evidence now is that there are not more heart attacks, but fewer heart attacks not more strokes, but fewer strokes. And the breast cancer story that keeps popping up is not related to estrogens because every study that looked at estrogens alone showed no change or increase in breast cancer. I have a niece in Madrid whose doctor won't give her HRT because she's frightened of cancer. That's the reason given. I'm absolutely furious, but I can't do anything about it. Now, the menopause suddenly burst into the news this year in the UK, thanks to the efforts of TV, TV presenter Davina McCall and documentary maker and author Kate Muir. 
Together, they said it's time that menopausal women emerge from the cupboard of neglect that they've been consigned to and receive consideration in their places of work, as well as the hormonal help that should be the right of every menopausal or perimenopausal woman who is in need of it. The government and the medical profession sat up for a change and took notice, as did the 13 million women of menopausal age in the UK. Their campaign immediately caused a huge demand for HRT products, leading to a shortage of supply. It is, however, important to say here that hormones shouldn't be given automatically to every woman of menopausal age. Many women are able to sail through the menopause without any help at all, my sister, for example, and move into a hugely creative period of their lives. The global menopause market is now suddenly estimated to be worth 480 billion, so the menopause is now getting some much needed attention although there are still a few women doctors who insist that the menopause is a natural part of a woman's life and doesn't need the help of HRT. Much to the fury of women who has experienced challenged this, this statement like my own. So I thought I would end this part of my talk with this picture of Mary Berry, now aged 87 and one of the best known and most re respected cookery writers and broadcasters in the UK and an outstanding example of a woman who is flourishing in her post-menopausal years. And I'd also like to bring this picture of Jane Goodall again, and another memorable quote, which I think each one of us might take to heart. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Most important advice I can give to the menopausal and postmenopausal woman, and indeed to all women listening to this talk, is to follow your heart. Your heart is the conduit to your soul and to the deeper feeling values that are carried there. Learning to follow your heart takes attention and practice and a dedicated focus on whatever your greatest gifts might be, gifts that are your gift to life and to your community. You may not be aware of them, unless you really contact your heart. You have to come out of your mind and go into your heart. There's been too much emphasis on the mind. Now, I was also asked to speak about the fear of death. So this last part of my talk will be about this subject. In view of the fact that death has always been part of human experience and that more than 6 million people worldwide have died from COVID, it seems strange that something of the greatest significance to all of us has been given so little attention. There is no one who will not sooner or later be affected by the death of a loved one, whether a grandparent, a parent, a partner, or a child. As we move into old age, the thought of leaving behind those we love when we die brings deep sadness. Trust in our survival beyond the death of the body is essential for living our lives without fear of dying. This beautiful painting records the visionary dream of a man called Jacob, who lived 3,000 years ago, a dream of angels moving up and down a ladder that stretched from earth to heaven. It may be helpful to remember this dream when living in a society where angels are never mentioned, and the mainstream scientific view is that consciousness does not survive the death of the physical brain. So after countless millennia of human life on this planet and all the vast amount of knowledge that has been available to us, we still know virtually nothing about the two most mysterious and challenging experiences of our lives, our birth and our death. From what other dimension of reality do we come at our birth? And to what other dimension of reality do we go when we pass, pass the threshold of death? Even more extraordinary is the silence of the media and the fact that both science and religion have ignored the large body of material accumulated over the last hundred or so years, recording non-ordinary experiences, that is near death, after death and out of the body experiences, as well as communications to the living from the so-called dead. 
the widely disseminated belief of mainstream science that consciousness originates in the neurons of the brain and that the death of the brain is therefore the end of consciousness has created a kind of firewall, closing our minds to this evidence and confining us to a prison of our own making. This belief was reflected in a statement by the late Stephen Hawking, reported in The Guardian in 2011. Brains are like computers. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. I often wonder what's happening to him now and what a shock he must have got when he realized he wasn't dead. <clears throat> now, many years ago, the late Sogyal Rinpoche wrote these words in the Tibetan book of Living and Dying, published 30 years ago in 1992. All the great spiritual traditions of the world, including, of course, Christianity, have told, told us clearly that death is not the end. They have all handed down a vision of some sort of life to come, which infuses this life that we are leading with a sacred meaning. But despite their teachings, modern society is largely a spiritual desert where the majority imagine that this life is all there is. Without any real or authentic faith in an afterlife, most people live lives deprived of any ultimate meaning. So they're really caught in consumerism and there's nothing else beyond. He continues, I have come to realize that the disastrous effects of the denial of death go far beyond the individual. They affect the whole planet. Believing fundamentally that this life is the only one, modern people have developed no long-term vision. So there is nothing to restrain them from plundering the planet for their own immediate needs and from living in a selfish way that could prove fatal for the future. Fear of death and ignorance of the afterlife are fueling the destruction of our environment that is threatening all our lives. Now he wrote that 92, that's about 40 years ago, I think. And he saw it coming, what's happening now. Now this is another painting, one of my favorites of Jacob's visionary dream, this time by William Blake. For thousands of years, shamanic cultures have known that there is a ladder of connection between this world and the unseen reality which permeates and interacts with our own. We could learn from the experiences of visionaries and mystics of all cultures and times, which have testified to the existence of other dimensions of reality and the possibility of a direct relationship with them. The greatest spiritual teachers of all cultures have testified to the existence of this reality have experienced the higher dimensions of it. In all cultures, even our own modern secular one, the belief in immortality is deeply instinctively present in the human soul. The greatest lunar myths from the ancient world, those of Sumer and Egypt, as well as the Christian myth of the death and resurrection of Jesus, all offer the lunar imagery of rebirth after the three days of darkness. Now, India has always known that the soul does not die. And we might listen to these words of a great Indian teacher, Paramahansa Yogananda. From joy, people are born. For joy, they live. In joy, they melt at death. Death is an ecstasy, for it removes the burden of the body and frees the soul of all pain springing from body identification. It is the cessation of pain and sorrow. Death is an experience through which you are meant to learn a great lesson. You cannot die. The neglect of this vitally significant field of human experience has meant that the experience and discoveries related to it, to it are considered irrelevant or worse symptoms of deluded or superstitious minds. Denial of those deeper dwelling faculties has led them to become atrophied for want of use. From this metaphysical desolation and the materialist belief that we live in a dead universe and that life is fundamentally meaningless, has come a culture of escalating violence, which now threatens us with the disintegration of civilization and ultimately with the possible extinction of our species.
Now, coming to the end of my talk, I would like to speak to you about the greatest modern pioneer in opening up the subject of life after death for Western culture as a whole. This was the Swiss-American psychiatrist, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who lived from 1926 to 2004. Like the stunning impact of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, in 1962, which drew our attention to the threat to the environment, the publication of her book on death and dying in 1969 tore away the veil that had shrouded this subject of death. Her life is a wonderful example of what a woman can accomplish in her menopausal and postmenopausal years. Almost single-handedly, assisted by her strong personality, as well as her extensive clinical experience as a doctor and psychiatrist, she broke through the taboo on the subject of death and transformed attitudes towards death and the care of the dying. Her later books, Death, The Final Stage of Growth, published in 1975, and on Life After Death, published in 1991, when she was 65, kept the subjects before the eyes of the public. And thanks to the rapid dissemination of her ideas through the media, as well as many workshops in different countries, led to many thousands, if not millions, having greater trust in their own and their loved one's survival after death. Her writing also led for a time to far better care of the dying and respect for their needs with many hospices, hospices, hospices for the dying being opened. There weren't any hospices before. This is something new and there aren't nearly enough of them. Her experience of caring for her dying patients taught her that many of them had near death or out of the body experiences, which gave them trust in their survival beyond the death of their body. Increasingly fascinated by this subject, she and her team studied the case histories of over 20,000 people from all over the world and from every cultural and social background who had had a near-death experience and returned to life after being declared clinically dead. Some had returned to life naturally and some through the rapidly developing skills of medical resuscitation. She compared the death of the body to the shedding of an outworn casing or cocoon, releasing the butterfly of the soul into life in another dimension. So these thousands of testimonies convinced her that there was no such thing as death, that it was an experience of transition to another state of consciousness. It seemed to her that it was nothing short of a tragedy that so many billions of people on the planet are not aware of this and die in ignorance that they will survive. She realized that after many years of work caring for the dying, she needed most of all to communicate to people the fact that death was not the end of consciousness. Near the end of her book on life after death, Dr. Kubler-Ross describes her own experience of the light and love of the divine ground, which we enter into when we die. It started with a very fast vibration or pulsation of my abdominal area, which spread through my entire body, and then the ceiling, the wall, the floor, the furniture, the bed, the window, the horizons outside of my window, the trees, and eventually the whole planet Earth. It was as if the whole planet was in a very high speed vibration. Every molecule vibrated. At the same time, something that looked like a lotus flower bud appeared and opened into an incredible, beautiful, colorful flower. Behind the lotus flower appeared the light that my patients so often talk about. And as I approached this light through the open lotus flower, I gradually and slowly merged into this incredible unconditional love, into this light. I became one with it. Traditionally, women have been the ones who care for the dying, just as they care for the newborn and the young. However, in the past, all the pronouncements on the nature of death and the survival of the soul from whatever religious tradition have been formulated by men. Here suddenly is a woman's perspective on death, a woman's trust in the survival of the soul. Her experiences, as well as those of many others, offer an opportunity to create a new vision of reality and an enlightened approach to dying, 
that could take humanity into a different understanding of both life and death. On the next to last page of death, the final stage of growth, she concludes, death is the final stage of growth in life. Only the body dies, the self or spirit is eternal. So I will end on that note, which I hope is a happy and reassuring one for all of you. <laughs>